Hi everyone, it's Angela Osterreicher and Nicole Askin and we're here to talk about the new PubMed. Uh, so this webinar will be recorded so it'll be available on our website afterwards so feel free to look back at the recording if you need to review anything. Also there is a chat box in which you can ask questions, feel free to ask them at any point and we're happy to address them as they come up or if you come to the end of the webinar we can also address questions at that point. Okay. So the WHA Virtual Library, just to give you some background, uh, we are an electronic library and we provide uh, resources and services to the WHA staff, to personal care homes and the WHA community health agencies. So we do have a variety of electronic resources and we still provide our traditional library services like literature searches, document delivery, education and training. So if you can't figure out new PubMed even after this, don't worry, we can do the searching for you too. Yeah, yeah. So today we want to review what is PubMed. Uh, basically, if you've not used PubMed before, it is a free database uh, put out by the National Library of Medicine. It covers biomedical and life sciences uh, uh, database, and it's a one of the go-to resources for most medical researchers, probably because it is available freely to the public. Uh, in order to use PubMed, you do need to learn how to use the MeSH subject headings and what MeSH is, it's, uh, it's a controlled vocabulary. So each item in PubMed has MeSH headings assigned to it. So for instance, if you were searching for cancer, uh, you can search that as a key term, but the subject heading assigned to it, you would look in the thesaurus, the controlled language, and it would actually tell you to use the word neoplasm. So it provides some control to the searching. And some of those terms, and you'll be demonstrating that a little bit later, have a hierarchy to them so that you can uh, make your search broader or narrower. Yeah, those terms are for the most part assigned by actual human beings as yes. opposed to just being assigned uh, by the database. Mm -hmm. So that means that someone's actually looked at this article and decided, okay, it mentions a whole bunch of different stuff, but really what it's about is this. Right. And the reason we're going over all this is because uh, the PubMed interface is changing uh, in the spring of 2020. So as of today, we've switched over to the new uh, format and we want to make sure that you're familiar with it. However, for the moment, they're still running simultaneously. So if you don't like the new one, you'd prefer to use the old one for a little while longer, you can still do that. Um, there's a banner at the top of the old one and the new one that allows you to switch back and forth. But over the next few months, uh, the old one will be decommissioned. Yes, so you'll want to become familiar with the new one. So how to get to the uh, our PubMed, it's uh, same as before. So you go to our homepage, uh, you can use either the tabs that you see at the top there, uh, find information or you can use the boxes down below there. So if you click on one of those, it'll bring you to this page where we have all of our databases listed alphabetically, but we've put a uh, easy quick find button on the left there for you to use so that you can click on PubMed. Yeah, you can also scroll down all the way down to the P section to find PubMed if yes. you want to. And also here's where you would find all the other databases as well if there's something that's not in PubMed that you want to take a look at. That's right. So if we click on that, we are led to the new interface. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is what the new interface landing page looks like. So this is where you would land when you hit that button. Uh, if you start clicking around through some of these links, you'll find that some of them still lead to the old interface. As I mentioned, they are still running simultaneously and the transition is still ongoing. So for example, the mesh database is still using the old interface. If you click on that link in the bottom right there, but over time, uh, I would expect to see that most of these links will be replaced by links to the new interface. Another couple things to mention about this page, if you see in the top right, that is my username. So if you had a My NCBI account in old PubMed, it still exists in new PubMed. You can still access it. All your saved searches, everything like that is still accessible to you. You'll just find that most of those links will be leading to the new interface rather than the old interface. The other cool thing to note about this is that part of the whole reason they're doing this redesign is to make the site a whole lot more mobile friendly. So if you've ever tried to search old PubMed on your phone, 
Uh, you may have been a little frustrated by that experience, but this new site is designed to be optimized for mobile viewing because they found that uh, a lot more people are doing searches on their phone, at the bedside, whatever. So this site is designed to be viewable as easily on mobile as on desktop. So once you actually enter search in that big search bar, you get to a results page that looks something like this. So let's just take a little bit of a breakdown of what this page actually is. So at the top there, you see the search terms that I've entered. And I'll talk in a little bit about how to search PubMed, what sort of terms you should be using. Uh, but we see we've got for this particular search, therapeutic hyperthermia, cardiac arrest, 6,900 results. So whereas in the old PubMed, you would just see a citation to each search result, here you actually see a snippet from the abstract with the search terms bolded. So that really helps you to identify the context that your search terms are being used in, in the particular search results. Uh, so I see in the first one, I've got cardiac arrest and like, therapeutic hypothermia in the title, which should be a good clue that that's what that article is about. But I also see that in the snippet of the abstract that appears, it's talking about uh, therapeutic hypothermia for patients who remain comatose following resuscitation from a cardiac arrest. So that kind of gives me an, a clue as to whether this article is really of interest to me based on what I'm, I'm searching for, as opposed to me having to actually click through and read through the abstract to figure that out. So it's sort of a, a quick at a glance view. Uh, something else to notice about this page at the sort of top right, you see sorted by best match. So in old PubMed, the default sort, uh, search order for the search results was to see the most recent results first. That's not the default here. The default here is to see what it believes to be the best match for your search terms first. So often you'll find your search terms in the title or at least as major subject headings. Um, that's because the system is trying to understand, sort of like Google does, what you really mean to say when you're typing in the search terms in the box there. And I'll explain in a little bit why that's important. Uh, but a couple other things to note on this page for the moment, uh, we see the advanced and create alert options right under the search box. We'll go over those in a bit more detail later. Under that, we've got save and email options and the, uh, the three dots there would link you to more save options um, for collections, that kind of thing. And then on the left-hand side, we've got our filters. And again, we'll be going over that in a bit more detail later. But for right now, Let's say that we've clicked on a particular search result, we would get to a page that looks something like this. So on the left hand side, we have our citation to the article. So we've got the title, we've got the journal name, we've got uh, the authors, etc. So all of the author names are clickable. So you could click on those author names and find other uh, results by those particular authors in PubMed if you wanted to. Underneath that, we have our persistent identifier. So what those are is we've got a PMID a PMC ID and a DOI. PMID is PubMed ID. It's a unique number that identifies this particular article within the PubMed database. A DOI is a similar thing, but it's not limited to just PubMed. So these are unique identifiers that would allow you to consistently return to this exact article. And if you look at the URL for that article, you'll usually see the PMID as part of it. Underneath that, we've got our abstract, and here it's displayed in full rather than uh, the snippet that we saw on the main results screen. Bottom right, we see page navigation, and we'll go through what's lower down on the page from this in a little bit, but for the moment, above that, we've got our sharing options. So they're really big on social sharing. You can post this to Twitter, you can post this to Facebook. And then above that, we've got our different full text links. So this particular article is in what's called PMC or PubMed Central. That means that it's available in full text for free with, even if you don't happen to have access to a library. But we also have our check library access button which is that yellow button right under PMC. And that button links to our particular uh, library search. So that button, you do have that button if you've accessed PubMed through the library version of, of the button, which means you've gone through the, the find information page that Angela was showing you earlier, you've gotten to PubMed through that, that means you're in the WHA version of PubMed, so you have that button, you can click back to the library search. And if you were to do that, you'd end up on a page that looks like this. So this is the record for this particular article in the WHA virtual library search. And you can see down at the bottom there, there's the WHA link that would allow you to have full text access to the article. Uh, you're going to want to remember, in case you haven't searched the library before, that you have access to the articles that are prefixed with WHA. 
So we see above the WHA link, there's an American Medical Association current link. That one you would not have access to, but the WHA prefix one you would. If there isn't any WHA prefixed link in the list here, which sometimes happens if we don't have a subscription to that particular journal, you would then see an option for WHA order sources that would allow you to request that the article be sent to you, which we would do for free. There's no cost to you associated with that. But you do need to be signed in with your WHA username and password in order to be able to see that. Yeah. All right, so heading back to PubMed, if we were to scroll further down on the result page, uh, we would get to this list of similar articles. So this feature did exist in old PubMed, but it wasn't quite as prominent. Here it's a really obvious option for you to find similar articles, by which we mean articles that PubMed has decided are similar to the one that you're currently looking at. So you have the option to show more and then to see all similar articles. We'll do a full search for articles that PubMed thinks are similar to this one. So this can be a really useful way. Uh, if you found an article that you think is absolutely perfect for your search, this can help you find similar ones that might also be exactly perfect for your search without having to do a number of iterations of searching. Underneath that, down at the bottom, you see cited by. So this will show you a list of articles in PubMed Central specifically that cite this particular article. Uh, if you wanted to find articles that cite this article that didn't happen to be indexed in PubMed Central, there is a way to do that in Google Scholar, for example, uh, but we're not going to go into detail about that here, but please feel free to ask follow-up questions or send us an email if you have um, more questions about that particular feature. Even further down on the page, we get to our MeSH terms. So Angela mentioned that MeSH terms are medical subject headings. They're a way of indexing a particular article based on a controlled vocabulary. In other words, uh, specific terms that will be consistent across different articles, even if the authors have chosen to use different language. Mm -hmm. For example, you see here heart arrest. So even if the author had chosen to use the term cardiac arrest instead, the MeSH term would still be heart arrest because that allows you to maintain a consistent indexing across articles. Uh, the ones here that have an asterisk are what's called major subject headings, which means that the article is mostly about these things. These are the major subjects of this article. You'll also see some of them have a slash and then another term afterwards. Those are subheadings. So for example, hard rest has subheadings, epidemiology, etiology, and mortality and therapy, and all of those are being discussed in this particular article. If you were to click on the drop down on the left hand side of each of those subject headings, you'd get the option that's popped up right under hospitalization there. So that gives you the option to search for that particular subject heading in PubMed directly, in MeSH, which would allow you, as Angela mentioned, to see what are the narrower and broader subject headings associated with it, or you could also add it to a search. So that would allow you to say, build a search that includes several of these subject headings. Maybe I want to have hospitalization and electric countershock and Hard rest etiology, I can click add to search for each of those and they would all show up in my search box. So a few things to mention about searching in new PubMed that's a little bit different from old PubMed. So I mentioned that it's got this best match search ordering by default. And the reason that that's really important is because the search is designed to be Google-like. And what I mean by that is it automatically maps your search to particular subject headings and also to other related terms. Uh, that can include anything from synonyms to uh, alternate spellings like British versus American spellings, for example. It can include different forms of verbs. So if you search walk, you'll get walking as well. And then um, it can include completely different but uh, synonymous terms. Like for example, here we see heart attack is being matched to the MeSH term myocardial infarction. So the system has actually interpreted the search heart attack as being equivalent to the mesh term myocardial infarction, even though I didn't type in those words at all. So this can be really helpful in automatically expanding your search for you, making it broader, but you can also end up with a search that's just too broad. So if you look at the details of the search we've got posted up here, it's searched for myocardial infarction, which is fine. It's searched for heart attack as a phrase, which is fine, but it's also searched for all articles that have heart and attack anywhere in the article, not necessarily even together. So that could potentially lead to a situation where you're finding articles that talk about someone who, say, has a fast heart rate and has an infection attacking their lymphatic system, for example. 
because it doesn't have to have those two terms together, it just has to have both of those terms somewhere in the article. So the way you would avoid that if you wanted to, first of all, you could copy and paste this entire search blurb into the search box and take out the bits that you don't want. Like you could take out the heart all fields and attack all fields bit. The other option you have would be to search in quotation marks, but that would prevent any of the mapping from happening at all. So if I had searched for heart attack in quotation marks, I would get the heart attack, all fields that, and that's it. I wouldn't get the myocardial infarction mesh at all. So it's a little bit of a balancing act in terms of weighing out uh, the benefits and the drawbacks of broadening your search versus having a very narrow targeted search. Uh, but by default, if you don't search with quotation marks, it'll automatically do this mapping process and it'll map it to various things that may or may not be actually relevant to what you're interested in. And this is why the best match ordering becomes really important because instead of getting the most recent articles that have any of these terms, you get what it thinks is you're most likely to be interested in based on the search of heart attack, which helps, but it, it's not perfect. So there are there are ways that you can play with it, but it's really important to try to remember how to balance being specific versus being broad. Another thing to know about the searching, if you worked with old Pabetta a lot, you may have run into this problem, um, truncation. So that's basically you're taking the first piece of a word and putting an asterisk and that will fetch all of the words that start with that piece. So for example, hypo with an asterisk would catch hypothermia, hypothyroidism, hypothesis, everything that starts with hypo basically. In old PubMed, uh, truncation was limited in that you could only catch up to 600 and then it would just cut it off. New PubMed doesn't have that limit at all. It'll catch absolutely everything that starts with that. So that's a way to make your search broader. But again, you want to be careful about um, managing breadth versus specificity. Another cool new feature uh, in new PubMed is you might have in previous uh, iterations of PubMed used what was called a single citation matcher. So new PubMed has what's called the citation sensor. So basically what that is, is if you enter search terms into the search box that PubMed recognizes are probably uh, looking for a specific citation. Like for here, for example, I've entered an author name, a journal abbreviation, and a year. So that's probably a citation that I'm interested in looking at. It'll automatically pull up matching citations at the start of your search results. And then after that, it'll show you a, a more broad general search on those terms. So here, for example, I've pulled up three articles that match uh, New England Journal of Medicine 2019 and Lazarus as an author. And one of these may be the article that I'm interested in. In this particular case, it was the third one. But um, that can be a really quick shortcut for you to find specific articles of interest. So I mentioned on the results page, we have these filters on the left-hand side of the screen. So this is a more detailed look at what those are. First off, at the very top, or close to the top there, we have the results by year graph. So this graph actually shows you an uh, overview over broad length of time, how many results you found in each year. And you can actually expand this to give you more detailed view of when are these citations coming from over time. So this particular search, the oldest citation was from 1816, the newest is from 2020. And I can use that slider at the bottom of the graph there to narrow down my search based on a specific time period. So for example, if I was only interested in citations from 1816 to 1850, I can move the slider on the right hand side to that particular time point, And then I pull up results with that particular time. Down at the bottom of the left hand side filtered list there, you've got publication dates. That's just a quick, uh, abbreviation of this process of moving the filter around for some of the most common publication date limits that you might see, like if you want only the most recent year, most recent five years, most recent 10 years, that's how you would do that. Underneath the date limit, we've got text availability. Uh, so you could, for example, limit your search to only those articles that include an abstract or only those ones that have free full text, which means anyone with it, regardless of their library access can get access to the full text. Under that is something that's a little bit newer in PubMed. It's called associated data. So basically what you would see if you use this particular attribute would be articles that have associated data in either another um, NCBI database or an external database like clinicaltrials.gov. 
So this can be really useful to trace um, the associated data for a particular article. So for example, if you, this particular article has an associated clinical trial and tr clinicaltrials.gov, you can get a lot more information about the data associated with the findings, which can help you to validate them, or at least to understand how the data was collected, how the recruitment was done. There's a lot more information available for you through that process. Under associated data, we have our article type filters. So this is pretty similar to what you saw in old PubMed. And then at the very bottom of the list there, you've got the additional filters button. And when you click that, you pull up this box that's on the right-hand side here. So this gives you some more options for article type. Uh, you also have the species limit. So if you want to limit to human studies as opposed to animals, that's how you would do that. Language, obvious, English only, French only, whatever. Uh, sex is here referring to biological sex. It has the options of male or female. Subject, uh, subject journal. Journal actually isn't relevant to specific journals. It's actually what are called sets of journals in PubMed. So for example, you could limit your search to their, their set of nursing journals, if that was of interest, for example. They also have a set of dental journals that might be relevant to your search. And then down at the bottom there, we've got age, which is what we can see on our screen here. You have a whole bunch of different options for age ranges. Clicking on any one of these would allow you to limit your search to that particular age range. Uh, one thing to mention is if a, a particular article covers a broader age range, like it doesn't specify just infants 1 to 23 months, for example, you might see that it includes several of these age ranges, and then choosing any one of those would pull up that article. Another quick cool feature to mention here, this is new, but you might be familiar with it if you've used uh, something like Google Scholar before, because they do this kind of thing, is this new site feature. So if you click on that button, or you can click on it either on the search results page or on the record for a particular article, you pull up the citation for that article. And down at the bottom left there, you can see you can copy that directly. You can download it in RIS format, and that's the format that's used by different citation managers, such as Zotero or EndNote. And you can also change the format in which it appears. So if you needed an APA citation, for example, you can use that drop down where it says format AMA, change that to APA, and all of a sudden you've got the APA version of that citation. Be handy when you're doing your uh, policies and you need your little citation in the right format. Yep. Also, if you've used a bookmarklet for a citation manager, you'll be pleased to know that new PubMed is compatible with those bookmarklets as well. So that'll allow you to quickly capture a whole bunch of citations at once rather than doubling in the RIS for one at a time. All right, so now I'm going to go through the advanced search feature. So you would access this uh, either through the advanced search link on the main landing page for PubMed or by clicking on the advanced link that's underneath um, the search box. This is where you can see details of your search history and you can combine uh, different search terms using Boolean and and or if you're familiar with that terminology and how to do that. This gives you uh, options for searching particular fields. So for example, if you wanted to search only in the title of the article, you can use the dropdown that currently says all fields to set that up. So this really gives you an easy way to create a more complicated search. The other cool option you have from this page is if you see your search history down at the bottom there, you can combine different parts of your search history. So say for example, I wanted to search heart attack or therapeutic hypothermia, I can just do number two, or number three, and that would be what that search would come up with. This is also where you would see the details of what your search is bringing up when it's doing the automatic term, term mapping. You would just click on the drop down that's underneath the details for each particular search, and it would show you what mesh terms it's being mapped to and what all fields terms it's being mapped to there. And then you can see on the right hand side the number of results you've got for each particular search. So now I'm going to pass it over to Angela to talk about search alerts. Okay, so there are some, certain circumstances you want to remain uh, up to date with a certain topic. Perhaps it's one of your competence goals to be the expert in heart attack. So when you've entered your search, heart attack, you'll see just below the search box that you can create an alert. So if you click on that, uh, it's going to ask you to log into your MyNCBI account. And if you don't have an account, you can set one up for, uh, for free. It gives you that option uh, to start a new account right there. So, And the reason you have uh, it asks you to create that account is so that you, within PubMed, you can save your searches or create alerts. So after you've entered in your MyNCBI uh, username and password, 
uh, you'll end up with this screen in front of you. So you can name the search. Uh, you can put in search terms in there that you want to have. You can indicate that you would like emails updated. You'll, it'll pull from your account that you've created your email to send the results to. And then we don't see all the options down below, but you can see a couple there, frequency, monthly. So it's going to ask you how, how frequently do you want to be updated? Uh, do you want it daily, weekly, monthly? Uh, it'll also ask you what format of the report do you want? Do you want the Medline uh, format? Do you want just an abstract format, a summary format, that type of thing? Uh, it'll also ask you how many items do you want to be sent? I usually indicate all of them because once you've done the original search you hopefully won't get that many updates in in the future uh, and then it, you just save the request and that way depending on how frequently you've asked for the results it'll just email you those results and in the old system and i would imagine in the new one as well i think on a yearly basis it'll remind you that you have this alert and ask you if you want to keep it or that it will expire yeah, and just to mention, heart attack would probably be a bit too broad yeah. for this kind of thing. Yeah, you definitely have to work on that search. Yeah. So another thing that you might want to do is uh, save or share your results. And you can do that as well as when you've put in your search terms and hit the uh, search, you will see the boxes below, save, email, and the three dots. So save allows you to select a format that, for instance, the RIS format, which Nicole mentioned before, you could select that format if you wanted to transport your records into a bibliographic manager like EndNote, Mendeley, or Zotero. Uh, you could also put them into a spreadsheet by selecting the CSV format. Uh, another quick way to grab all the PMIDs uh, is to use the PMID format from that list as well. Uh, you have quite easily, you can share your search results. Uh, you can share them all or just click the individual boxes that you want to keep and email those results to yourself or to a colleague so that you can share your search results that way. Uh, when you click on the three dots, you get that drop down menu. So you see clipboard, my bibliography collections. Clipboard, the purpose for that is, let's say you've done the search therapeutic hypothermia. You've had, you know, 30,000 searches. You've picked 10 of them that you want, uh, 30,000 citations, and you've picked 10 out of those that you want to keep that are relevant. You can check them off and then send to Clipboard. That'll save it in memory for a short period. Uh, I forgot to check how long the period was. It used to be eight hours, I think, previously, but it'll save them for a period of time. And the purpose you want to do that is you might decide that uh, you should also be searching on surface cooling or endovascular cooling. So those are other terms that you've thought of to search on. So you can continue doing your searching on those terms and then save any of these citations that you'd like from those into your clipboard. And then when you're finished, you can visit your clipboard and decide to download it to a, uh, a reference manager software or to email them to yourself. So that's the purpose of the clipboard. If you don't have a reference manager uh, like EndNote or uh, Mendeley or Zotero, uh, PubMed offers the My Bibliography format. So you could actually save some of your citations and format them into a bibliography. Uh, you can save the ones that you found in your search, and it also gives you the option to manually enter some uh, some citations so you could add them as well. And what you can do as well is you can create a URL from those results in My Bibliography and then share them with someone. And again, collections is the same idea. So if you don't have a reference management software uh, where you could create file folders and keep all your search results, PubMed has created collections so you can uh, create various collections, or I think of them as file folders, and enter your search results in, appropriately into uh, the file folder that you want to use at a later date. So that brings us to the end. 
Uh, we are happy to entertain any questions. We'll stay on the line uh, another minute or so if you have questions that you're thinking about. Uh, reminder that uh, we have all our contact information there if you have any questions. Uh, the webinar will be uh, saved and will be posted in a day or two and we will be sending out the slide deck to all of our attendees. And please feel free to contact us and let us know if there's any other uh, webinars that you're interested in or if you have uh, more detailed questions about PubMed that we can help you with. So at this point we'll just mute ourselves so that uh, you can uh, think about some questions and send them in and we'll be back in a couple of in a minute or so. <laughs>